We are on um, week two of a four-week sermon series, um, um, Great Women of Faith. Uh, not women of faith in the Bible, but women of faith that are not necessarily more contemporary to us, but that have occurred between biblical times and today's times. Um, today, it, last week, I said that it was that Katie Luther was the worst I would do. I think that was a mistake. A lot of people really enjoyed it. So the expectations are high. So what I'm going to say to you is, Susanna West is as good as it's going to get, so I'll downhill from here. Take a little bit of pressure off myself. You know, then I got my liturgist up here putting pressure on me about perseverance. But I'll overcome. I'll just keep going. It's okay. So, <laughs> Susanna... Wesley. Um, Susanna Wesley is uh, the mother of uh, John and Charles Wesley. The Wesley brothers are uh, credited with uh, and responsible for the creation of Methodism that we have in our modern world today. So I, I didn't know where to start this story at, so I, I guess I'm just going to dive into it. I have I have like two pages of information that I want to make sure that I share with you. She is the type of person who Katie Luther was a very nice person. Her and Martin Luther had a very good relationship. Susanna Wesley was somebody who had to persevere. When you, when you have a sermon that's about perseverance, you know that this is not going to necessarily be a good story. But it has some absolutely great points, and it's because of her perseverance, her ability to stick with it. And when I talk about perseverance, I'm not talking about, oh, there's nothing I can do, I might as well just go along with it. I'm not talking about giving in. What I'm talking about is I'm talking about being proactive. Like, these bad things continue to happen to me, but I'm going to not only live past them, but I'm going to overcome them, and I'm going to use them to glorify God. And I think that kind of separates Susanna Wesley from everybody else. So, let's get this right into perspective right away. She is the 25th child of her parents. Not a dad who has multiple moms, you know, was married and his wife died, was married somebody young again, and that wife died and then married somebody. No. Two people. 25 kids. She's the 25th child of her parents. I, I couldn't find how many survived. But then she went on to have 19 children herself. Seven children in the first seven years of her marriage. Holy cow. Ten of those children survived to adulthood, which was better than the average of her day. So here's this woman. She had, over time, 19 children. The first seven years of her marriage, she had seven children, and her, her husband, well, yeah, her husband is an Anglican priest. He's He's with the Church of England. But let's go back a little bit further. So, Susanna Wesley, the 25th child of a couple, her father was a minister as well. He was a, a pastor. He was a Puritan minister. So, man, there's all this church history stuff. So, the Church of England, the Anglican Church, was the... Uh, uh, created for a political reason. So the king was married. Um, his wife didn't give him a male heir, and he wanted to annul the marriage. So he wrote to the pope, so I want to annul the marriage. I have this hottie, Anne Berlin, who is willing to marry me, and I know she'll give me a son. I need an annulment so I can get married to her, to have a male 
Paul said, no. And the king said, fine, make my own church. I know my own marriage. So the Anglican church was born out of that whole political upheaval. And so the Anglican church is going along, and there's different factions that are created into the Anglican church. This is the Anglican church comes around close to the time of Reformation. The, the, the king of England said, well, hey, if they can do it over in Germany, we can do it here in England, surely. Everything will be fine. Plus, English people, you know how they are. They kind of get set in their ways, and they don't want to really listen to anybody. It's kind of where we got it from, I think. So, um, so you have this, these factions within the church, and in the church you have Puritans, that's a faction of people who want to stay in the Anglican church and they want to change it from the inside. So that is what Susanna Wesley's father was. He was a minister who was a Puritan minister. He wanted to change the Anglican church from the inside. Then you have separatists, people who want to leave the Anglican church. They don't agree with it. They don't think there's any way to change it from the inside. And that's where we get pilgrims from. So pilgrims left the Anglican church because they thought there was no hope for it. And they left, they were persecuted, and they were tired of being persecuted. Uh, they went to Holland, they, the high, people from the Netherlands didn't want them, and so they came to America. Pilgrims. And so this is the time that Susanna Wesley is alive. Her father is a Puritan minister preaching for change in the Anglican church. And at the age of 13, she begins to study, probably before the age of 13, but at the age of 13, she makes a decision about Anglican law, the law of the church. So she spends some time studying the law of the church, and she decides that her parents, her father in particular, is wrong. Does that sound like a 13-year-old to you? Dad, you are completely wrong. The Anglican Church is just fine the way it is. And so she becomes a devout Anglican church member. And her and her father argue and fight. And she meets a guy, not at 13, a little bit later. She meets a guy named Sam. Samuel. His last name is Wesley. And they get married. He's minister of the Anglican Church. But he's not a very good minister. I don't know if you've ever had one here, but I know that at the church where I grew up as a child, we had a couple of ministers who were rigid, moralistic, um, really good at telling you what you were doing wrong. Not very good at telling you, good job, team, way to go. That's the kind of minister that Samuel Wesley was. Not very many people in church like him. When he went to a church, boy, there weren't a whole lot of people there. <coughs> in fact, eventually he gets to the point where He's not assigned by the Anglican Church because he's unassignable. And he has to find a church of his own. So, seven years into their marriage, they moved to this place called Epworth. Maybe you've heard of it before. A few Methodist names that go with Epworth. And so, they moved to Epworth where he is a minister at the church, but he's not paid by the government. You see, Anglican priests are paid by the government, they're guaranteed salary, but he's not. He's paid by the people of the church. And so things are very tough. It's a hard way to make a living as a minister in England. So here they are. They're in Epworth. Um, I don't know how many of her first seven children survived, but she has small children. And he's not a very well-liked person. He also has a hard time dealing with financial matters. In fact, over the course of their marriage, he drove them to bank bankruptcy at least three times. So he was not well-liked. He was kind of strict and rigid. He drove them to bankruptcy. 
And then, beyond all of that, they had an argument. So, they were a very religious couple. And if you looked at them from the outside, they were very much a couple. They were married, but they had their problems inside of the house. And so, one night, as they were praying before bed, Samuel prays for King William, and that God would bless King William and his house. And he says amen, and Susanna refuses to say amen. She says, no, I don't agree with King William. I, I don't think he's a legitimate king of England. I believe the Stuart line of kings should be, you know, the Stuart family should, should have the, the place of being the king and queens of England. And I can't say amen. And he said, well, if you're not going to say amen, we're not going to sleep in the same bed together. And she said, fine. <laughs> this is the kind of woman that we're dealing with. Fine, you don't want to sleep with me, go ahead. Sam was really good at, Samuel Wesley was really good at um, um, going to ministers' um, conventions. And he would go, and he really liked to be theological, he liked to talk to other ministers, but he wasn't a very good pastor. And so he found one of these conventions to go to, and he left her for five months. So here she is at home with these little kids, I don't know where they're at in these 19 children, actually I kind of do. But I'm not sure what number they are on the ten who are alive. So here she is, at home with these kids, no income, nothing happening. Her husband is off in London at a pastor's convention, and they're arguing over who should be the king of England and whether or not that person should receive their blessing. So what I'm saying here is it's a two-way street. Now, he might not have been a very good guy, but man, if you've ever had an argument with your spouse, you know nobody's blameless in arguments. It's always somebody's fault. Don't get me wrong. It's usually mine. I admit that openly and honestly. Huh? You said anniversary. It's hard to have an anniversary during the COVID. I'm late to that party. You know, some of you probably already experienced that. It's hard to have a good anniversary during COVID. That's what we determined. We determined this week that we're going to find something to do when COVID is not such a big issue. We're going to ditch our kids and go do that. But back to the story of Susanna and Samuel Wesley. So he's away at this meeting for ministers for five months in London. In the time that he's away, King William dies. Problem solved, right? King William dies, he comes back home, and they must have reconciled because nine months after he arrived home, John Wesley was born. <laughs> so, we have this woman. She has ten children. She homeschools all of her kids. Every one of her kids is homeschooled. Um, in one of her letters, she talks about how she would take a break from her kids. And so the way that she would take a break from her kids is she would stand in the middle of the room and she would put her apron over her head and ignore them. And you know it takes a strong-willed person to stand in the middle of the room with an apron over their head and ignore kids as they're coming to bother you, especially if there's ten of them. Because with ten kids, it never ends. I know with four kids, it barely ever ends. I know with ten kids, it could never end. But she was a, I don't want to say she was strict, but she was regimented. You got ten kids and you're homeschooling, you better be regimented. And so 
they had their studies to stick to. So they would study French, they would study, study theology, they would study uh, writing, uh, they would study mathematics. And all of her children were very highly educated because she had been highly educated. She had studied and education was important. And so we see education as being important in the Wesley household. In fact, one of the stories that her daughter tells is of the fact that when you cried as a child, you couldn't cry loudly. I don't know exactly how this works with kids, but the kids all agreed, all of the Wesley children agreed, you couldn't cry loudly if you were one of Susanna Wesley's children. I don't know how you tell a four-year-old to cry quietly. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but she did. So none of her kids, when they were crying, cried loudly. And when she put her kids to bed, she didn't go and tuck kids in. They were expected to go to bed, and they were expected to be quiet. And so there was no bedtime story. There was no calming down. There was no kissing boo-boos. None of that occurred in the Wesley household. It was bedtime, you went to bed. That was it. So she was a very regimented person. And so out of this regimented person comes two sons, John and Charles Wesley, the founders of Methodism. They both went away to college uh, to become ministers, to follow in the steps of their grandfather, Susanna's dad, and their father, Samuel Wesley, and they went away to college together. And while they were at college, they would meet in these groups, in these kind of accountability groups. And there would be several men, they would get together, they would meet, they would pray for each other, they would be about doing uh, work for the church, they would uh, help the poor and sick and needy, they would help children uh, who needed help with their education. They, service was a very important to them. It had been instilled in them from a young age from their mother, Susanna. And the other guys at college began to notice this group of guys, and what they had was a method. This was their method for being religious. They were accountable to one another. And so people began to tease them and call them the Methodists. Oh, you're a bunch of, oh, you're with Wesley? Oh, he's one of those Methodists. And it stuck. And Methodism was born. And so as John and Charles Wesley grew, they grew in this time after the Reformation. It was actually during a time called the Enlightenment. And in England at the time, remember we have the Anglican Church, and it's run by the state, basically, to be an aid for the king and the queen and for the royal family. And then we have Puritans who are trying to reform the church from the inside. And then we have these people who have left, these separatists that have left and gone to America, the pilgrims. But at this time of the Enlightenment, there comes along these great Preachers. So these great preachers begin to crop up in England. Now I knew I was going to forget one of their names. I didn't put it down. Edwards, Jonathan Edwards was one. He's a great preacher. Um, I want to say Wycliffe, but Wycliffe comes before them. Whitfield, George Whitfield was a great preacher of the time. And so George Whitfield shows up. And Jonathan and John and Charles Wesley show up on the scene. And so here are these two brothers. Uh, Charles Wesley is known as the hymn writer of Methodism. He wrote over 3,000 hymns. We're going to sing one of his hymns at the end here today, all for a, t a thousand tons to sing. Um, if you look in the Methodist hymnal, you'll see his name quite often. He's one of the most prolific people in the Methodist hymnal and 3,000 hymns. 
And like when he wrote a hymn, like over a thousand tons to sing, we have seven of the verses in the book, in the hymn book. We're not going to sing all seven of those today. We're, we're only going to do two. Well, you're, you and I are going to do many. We're going to listen to two. But over a thousand tons to sing, way more than seven verses. Very theological. He was a very well-read person. Um, one of the things that Charles Wesley did was he used bar songs to put his hymns to. So when you are singing all oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, no, you're singing the bar tune. Just, just be aware of that. It's a bar tune. He would use bar tunes to put his words to because people already knew the songs, the music of the song. And so he would make new words for it. They were very theological. And John Wesley was a great preacher. So, as these two young men are getting their start, John Wesley writes home. He's, a, he's graduating from college. He writes home and he says, I have this feeling that I should begin my ministry. I should start preaching. He's finished his, what would be equivalent today to a master's degree. And his father says, no. Don't start your ministry, go on, get your PhD, become a doctor. And his mom says, yeah, how much more can you learn? Get busy, get to work. So even as they are going into their twilight years, Susanna and Samuel Wesley did not agree. Um, let's visit the bankruptcy for a little bit. So the Wesley family went bankrupt three times, and the third time, Samuel Wesley was arrested and put in jail. And so Susanna Wesley has these ten children at home, and her husband's in jail, and she goes to the constable of the town, the person who's put him in jail. It's a wise decision for the government to put somebody who owes a lot of money into jail. It's a good way to make sure that they'll pay it back, by the way, because they can really work it off in jail. I don't know what the thought process was in 17th century England, but here they are. Uh, she goes to the constable and she talks her husband out of jail. So she talks him out of jail and she takes over the finances and, and things begin to improve. But then he passes away. Samuel passes away and and Susanna is left in Epworth. They have a home, remember I said they weren't officially hired by the Anglican Church, and therefore they didn't have a home that was owned by the Anglican Church. It was their home, so she was able to live there. And so she's living in her home. And remember what I said? People really didn't like Samuel as a minister. Well, the new replacement was kind of in his shoes. People didn't like him. So Susanna Wesley began to invite people over to her home after church. And so she would sit in her kitchen and she would get sermons out. She, she had all of her father's sermons. She had all of her husband's sermons because people wrote their sermons out completely at that time. And so she began to preach. No. She began to read those sermons. She didn't really preach, because at that time, women weren't allowed to preach. And people began to show up. And they would sing hymns, and she would read sermons, and they would have discussions, theological discussions, around her kitchen, and then soon her kitchen was full, and then soon her house was full, and then people would begin to stand outside of the home, and the minister of the new, of the new minister of the church began to complain, and officials began to complain, and this is her response, not a quote, but close, I'm reading what my father and what my husband wrote. I am not preaching, and no, I will not stop. 
finally stop, do a better job. Now, one story that I skipped over was uh, John Wesley, when he was very young. Um, and his mother called him Jack. Um, uh, their house burnt. He was six years old, and the house was on fire. Uh, they had everybody, they thought they had everybody out. Can you imagine trying to figure out if you have ten kids out of a house that's on fire? Um, house fires were not uncommon in that time because they heated with coal. And so the house was on a blaze, and they figured out that John wasn't there. And so everybody went into a panic, and one of the neighbors said, well, there's a boy in the window upstairs. And there was John, I say little Jack, was up in the window, hanging out the window, crying for help. And so the neighbors all formed a human ladder and climbed on top of each other, grabbed young John Wesley out of the window. And as they were coming down from getting John out, the roof on the house collapsed. And from that point forward, everybody in the Wesley family, well, not everybody, uh, Samuel and Susanna were sure that John had a call from God. And so therefore, kind of got pushed into this role that he finds himself in. And I want to say to you that I think John Wesley was greatly influenced by his mother Susanna. We are, we're all influenced by the people who raise us. And it is obvious in the church that John and Charles Wesley started, that her influence can be felt. In that when it began to really form up and these meetings began to form, these Bible studies, these accountability groups, that women were included in those groups. And I see women as being included in the United Methodist Church in a way that is, in a way that is above and beyond some other denominations because of the influence of Susanna Wesley. She persevered through all the difficulty in her life. And her children saw the difficulty that she had. Nineteen children born. Ten grew to adulthood. That means nine of her babies died in her arms. One of her daughters at the age of 13 tragically passed away. The stories are heartbreaking about the deaths of her children. You know that Susanna Wesley grieved greatly for each of those children. It had to have torn her apart, but yet she kept going. She not only survived, but she persevered because she knew of God's presence in her life. She taught her children through a difficult marriage. She persevered. She stayed married to Samuel when others probably would have separated and stayed apart. But yet she remained faithful to the marriage that they had together. She is a woman who stuck it out, and I think that shows in Methodism today. I don't know if you're aware of it, but United Methodist women have always been a strong group of people doing the work of the church. United Methodist women were some of the people who were responsible for outlaw here in the United States. They were a major part of that group that made it illegal for the United States at Prohibition time. We don't really talk about that in history very much. But they led that movement. Whether it be right or wrong, they were active in the church, prison ministry, helping the poor, the 
who Susanna Wesley was. We see it in her children, and we see it in the church. She affected the men, she raised the men who started the movement that we're a part of. It's amazing to me to think that without her, we wouldn't have the United Methodist Church. We wouldn't have Methodism, as it were. And I think that's the thing, as we hear all of these stories, 19 children, only 10 survived. A house that completely burns down, and yet she perseveres. Bankruptcy three times, and she perseveres. Difficulties throughout her life. Her husband passes away, and the church begins in her own home. John and Charles Wesley lived through that. They saw how much their mother cared for people. How much she pastored them. It's very rare that a pastor's wife is more loved than the pastor, but I believe that was true for Susanna Wesley. And the people loved her, and her children loved her. She was an amazing person who persevered through difficult times in her life. There's a lot more written about Susanna Wesley. I have just scratched the surface. But I'm here to tell you that she's a great example of keeping on in the face of difficult times. We talked about Katie. And we talked about Suzanne. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to add a couple of more women to our group. And I hope that this series will encourage you to see that no matter where you are or no matter what is happening in your world, that God can use you right where you're at to do great things. God used Katie Luther in a great way. God used Susanna Wesley in a great way. God can use you in a great way. And these were normal people living extraordinary lives for because they chose to be faithful. They chose to persevere. They chose to follow. I hope you will make that same choice. Will you pray with me? God of grace and mercy, we give thanks that you are there with us to see us through. Help us to persevere through the difficult moments in our own lives. And help us to not just get through Persevere for you. In Jesus' precious name.
positivity. 